All right, so let me start my second lecture. So before starting the second lecture, uh, let me first review what we did yesterday. So uh, yesterday, I first explained the relation between the existence of conserved charges and the factorization of the S matrix. And then uh, I used the fact that, uh, well, then I used the Yambaxta equation to uh, constrain the S matrix of the ON sigma model. And the S matrix uh, took this form. And it's parameterized by the rapidity theta. And there is an overall factor that I wrote down yesterday. And then there are three different tensor structures. And, and the relative coefficient okay, is something like this. And the argument which led to this conclusion uh, was based on the young Baxter and the crossing. So basically, these two coefficients were determined by imposing the young Baxter equation and the crossing symmetry. And although I didn't have much time to explain that, uh, you can also constrain this object, which is the oval factor. And the oval factor has to satisfy several equations. First, because of the crossing symmetry, it has to satisfy this equation. And furthermore, it has to satisfy the unitarity condition, which is basically if you multiply the S matrix of minus theta and S matrix of theta, then you should get the identity matrix, which in, the, uh, in this pictorial notation, which is something like this. So the index just goes along the particle. And, and if you just compute this object, then uh, this object is S0 minus theta times S0 theta. And there is some contribution coming from this uh, matrix structure, especially uh, so there are two ways to get this identity. So one is like connecting to identity. And the other is uh, connecting uh, to of this structure. And essentially, if you compute this part, then this gives you uh, theta square plus 4 pi square delta square, sorry, 4 pi square delta square over theta squared. And the condition is that this should be 1. And you can solve this uh, two equation. One is this, and the other is this, to find the solution for S0, which is written in terms of gamma function. So that was what I did yesterday. And today, so I'm going to talk about uh, what else, or what other quantum, what, are, what other physical quantities that you can compute if you have the integrability. And to show that, I'm going to use another simple model, which is called, uh, sometimes called XXX spin chain, or it's also called Heisenberg spin chain. And the reason I chose this spin chain is firstly because they are simplest. Uh, it's simplest. And, and secondly, it emerges, well, it plays an important role in the study of n equals 4 supersymmetric Yamu theory in four dimensions. So yesterday we were in two dimension, but today we are in four dimensions, so we are close to the nature. But unfortunately, uh, the theory I'm going to talk about is the farthest, I mean, from the nature, because n equals 4 supersymmetric Yamu theory is actually maximally supersymmetric. Uh, yeah, mu theory and the supersymmetry hasn't found in nature so far. So, but, okay, so, so today I'm going to talk about how this spin chain uh, emerges from n equals 4 super mu theory. So the title of the second lecture is spin chain from 
n equals 4 c pi m nils. OK. Is there any questions so far? All right, so, so let me review the basic facts about n equals 4 c pi m nils theory. So let me review the basic facts about n equals 4 super mu series. So, so basic facts. So, so n equals 4 super mu series is a supersymmetric generalization of a mu series. So the Lagrangian, of course, contains the gauge coupling and also trace of f mu nu, sorry, in my normalization, it's minus one quarter f mu nu, f mu nu, and bunch of, well, whatever that you need to put in order to make it supersymmetric. So there are like a bunch of terms. But what's important for me is that there is this coupling constant, the quartic coupling constant for the scalar. So this is the only important piece for my talk today. Okay, let me then explain the field contents of n equals 4 super mu theory. So as I said, n equals 4 super mu theory contains gauge field and mu. And in addition to that, it contains six scalars So it actually has SO6 symmetry, uh, which rotates these scalars. So, and as you heard in Freddy's lecture, uh, you can, SO6 is the same as SO, sorry, SU4. So you can write it also in this way, using SU4 notation, where A and B runs from one to four. And this matrix, so this A, this A and B is antisymmetric with respect to the exchange of A and B. So these are all bosonic fields contained in A equals 4 super mu theory. And it also has fermions because it's supersymmetric. And there are basically uh, eight fermions. So the fermions belong to the uh, fundamental and anti-fundamental representation of SU4. And alpha and alpha dot is just a spinner indices which runs from one to two. And then A is again from one to four. And, and another important fact is that, well, as I said, it has global SO6R symmetry. which acts on those indices, A, B, and I, A, and A, B, and I. And plus, what's important is that it's actually conformal. And which is SO4, comma two, because we are living in four dimension. And importantly, if you combine, you can actually combine this with uh, n equals 4 supersymmetry, then you can get a nice group which is called uh, PSU 2, 2 slash 4. And okay, I don't explain the details, but essentially it contains SU 2, 2 and SU 4. And this SU 4 is essentially SO 6 R symmetry I just described. And this SU 2, 2 is SO 4, 2. So, okay, so this is just the basic facts. And of course, using the uh, supersymmetry transformation, you can map for boson to fermions or fermion to boson. And another important fact is that because it has a conformal symmetry, so it's actually CFT, it's 4D CFT, 
And in conformal field theory, the, the natural object to study is, like of, is the correlation function of local operators. For example, if you consider the two-point function, then the two-point function is, takes this form. And essentially, the only important information of the two-point function is contained by this exponent, which is nothing but the eigenvalue of the dilatation operator acted on, on O of A, and which is also called uh, conformal dimension. And another important data for, for, this, for the general conformal field theory is, uh, as you may have heard, uh, the structure constant. And essentially, the structure constant is something like this. And I have some exponent here. And the important part, important point is that A, B, C here, X, two, three, delta B, C, A, X, three, one, delta C, A, B, where delta I, J, K equals delta I plus delta J minus delta K. An important point here is that if you use the conformal symmetry, you can actually fix uh, the space-time dependence of the three-point function, and then the only important information is contained in this part, which is, the, which is called the structure constant. Okay. So these are general features of n equals for super mu theory. So now it's a challenge how to erase a blackboard. Okay, so and there is another important point that I would wish to make regarding n equals for super mystery. And that's about the large n limit. Of course, I think it's many of you already heard about it, but I just want to make a few words about it. Okay, but. So, the important point is that, as I wrote in that blackboard, N equals four super mu theory has many fields, bosons and fermions and gauge fields, but the point is that uh, because it has a very large supersymmetry, which is N equals four supersymmetry, all the fees are connected by the supersymmetry transformation. In particular, which this means that all the fields are in the adjoint representation of the gauge group because we know that A mu is in the adjoint representation of the gauge group and others are related by the supersymmetry. So in practice, uh, well, okay, what should I do? Uh, in practice, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna use this side. So, in practice, uh, it means that all the fields, including phi and psi, are essentially matrices. So, with n times n indices. And so, what is it good for? So, if you have this kind of theory with just matrix degrees of freedom, then uh, it was shown by Tofuf that there is a kind of very nice limit uh, in, which, uh, in which the Feynman diagram uh, can be organized into subclasses, which is called the large n limit. So essentially, the large n limit in this case is defined by taking n to be infinity, where n is the rank of the gauge group. Now I'm considering the un mu theory. And then, uh, at the same time, I send g m mu to zero so that uh, g m mu times n, g m mu squared times n, which 
is often called to foofed coupling stays finite. Okay, and in this limit, uh, especially if you look at the leading order which survives in the large n limit, you can show it, that some kind of diagram are actually suppressed. For example, let's consider this vacuum bubble. And you can also consider different vacuum bubble like this. Okay, so maybe, yeah. So this is just a very stupid re review of large n counting. So what I mean by this double line is actually the propagator of the field. So this is actually like a propagator field. And the reason I put double line is because I have like a two in indices for each field. For example, this is the gauge indices. And they are connected by some delta function. And essentially, if you count the contribution from this guy, then you have gm mu's here, gm mu's here, gm mu's here, gm mu's here. So you have gm mu's to force. And on the other hand, there is also a factor of n coming from this loop because you have delta function and then they contract it with the delta function. So you have n here, n here, n here, and n up from outside, which, in, which means you have gm mu's to four times n to four. On the other hand, this gives you the same gm mills to four, but of course, the counting of n is different because there is only one phase here, and, and in addition to the outer phase, so you get this behavior, and in the two foot limit, in which this uh, combination is fixed, then you can see that this is actually, this object is one over n squared suppressed as compared to this object. Okay, so this was just a very, very basic review about n equals four super mu theory. And now, I'm going to study the correlation function, especially today I'm gonna to talk about two-point function of n equals four super mu theory in the large n limit. So two-point at large n. So when you talk about the correlation function, you first need to specify which kind of operator you are going to talk about. And in the large n limit, there is a very basic or fundamental class of the operators, uh, which is called the single trace operator. So, so as I said, n equals four super is gauge, gauge theory. So in order to define physically reasonable observables, you need to find uh, uh, some gauge invariant operator. And the simplest way to make it is to multiply the fields, maybe phi, phi i1. So let's co just consider the case where you only have scalars. So these i's are R symmetry indices, which runs from one to six. And then take the trace. And this is obviously gauge invariant because as I said, each field is matrices, each field is matrix, and then if you just multiply them and take the trace, then there are no uh, indices on which the gauge, uh, gauge transformation can act. So this operator is the kind of fundamental object and called a single trace operator. And so then let's consider the correlation function of this kind of operator. So in particular, I'm going to consider the operator made up of just scalars, as I wrote here, for simplicity. So the simplest computation you can do is to do the three level computation. At three level, of course, things are very easy. So you have operator one, let's say, so you have, okay, let's call it A, A, and B. Okay, and I'm going to represent, represent uh, the single trace operator by circle, and I put some dots here. And each dot basically means that uh, you are putting some scalar field here. So this dot is phi of I1. 
And the reason I draw a circle is because I'm taking the trace. So I just want to make it clear that it's periodic. And then I have another operator, OB. And at tree level, what you need to do is, of course, do the weak contraction. But because of the large N limit, basically, you cannot draw diagrams that crosses. OK, sorry, I need to put. So which means that, OK, if you draw something like this, then from the same argument, you can say that this is actually 1 over n squared suppressed. So what you can do is to just uh, connect those fields, keeping this order. So essentially, this is just this is very simple. And of course, what you get is something like x to uh, 2 times uh, the length of the operator, where length is essentially the number of fields inside the operator. So this is the structure of the two-point function at tree level. And now, of course, this is a bit boring. So now I'm going to study uh, one-loop computation. So before doing the computation, let's try to see what I will get if I do the computation at one loop. By the way, here, one loop means one loop in lambda. And n is always infinity. So let's ask what kind of structure we, we expect to get. So if you consider this two-point function, the tree level is this one. And then I have some one. And then there is some loop level contribution. But the first thing you notice is that, OK, so this operator is composite operator, where many fields are at the same position. So you expect some divergence if you start uh, computing the loop correction. And in particular, because the coupling of the n equals 4 super mu series is marginal, as, as, you, as I show over there, uh, it's the quartic of scalars. So what you expect to get is something, log, something like log log. So you should get something which is proportional to log of lambda, where lambda is the cutoff that you chose. But of course, in physics, it's not allowed to put lambda inside log, because it should be dimension independent. So you need to make a dimension independent combination uh, from the parameters you have. And the only uh, parameter that has length here is actually x. So you need to put here x. And then, OK, so this is actually delta. I'm sorry. And, and then, well, in general, you don't know what, what you get in front. And it can be some non-trivial matrix, which depends on a and b. So this is the structure you expect to get if you do the naive computation of the two-point function. But uh, this sounds problematic from the point of view of conformal, conformal field theory. So I said that n equals 4 super mu theory is conformal field theory. So it's a bit strange that the correlation function of the uh, operators depends on the cutoff scale that you chose. And of course, there is a well-known way to cure this problem, which is to do the renormalization of the operator. Essentially, in this case, what you need to do is uh, define the renormalized operator in this way. So I said H is some matrix. So I put, put some, something like this. And then I multiply like this. So essentially, this extra factor that I put in order to define the renormalized operator basically kills this uh, unnecessary lambda dependence. And what you are left with in the end is, is what? OK, so where, where is the eraser? Ah, OK, it's over there. Oh. So Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know what is the good strategy to e erase the blackboard. Okay, now I'm going to erase this. So, okay, so what I was saying is that you have, okay, so, uh, so if you use the renormalized operator, instead you, what you get is basically killing that unnecessary lambda dependence, and then what you get in the end is something like this. So sorry for using the middle of the blackboard, okay, but so what you get in the end is that renormalized operator of ON and OB. Okay, so let me say another thing. So, so this defined renormalized operator, but in order to have a nice uh, uh, two-point function, it's also nice to choose some basis which diagonalizes H. And let's assume that we took already such a basis. So this is a different basis from like a naive basis which I wrote there. Then the two-point function should behave something like this. So now uh, it's delta one, two, and then, so, okay, so now it's proportional to delta one, two, and then I have something like two times gamma one times log of x one, where two times gamma one is essentially the eigenvalue of h. So here I basically kill the uh, lambda dependence because of the renormalization, and you realize is that this is just the expansion of gamma one up to one loop. So this means that the eigenvalue of H basically gives you the correction to the dimension. So this is why it's called anomalous dimension, of course. And this procedure basically gives you a way to compute the anomalous dimension using the perturbation theory. So what you first need to do is to compute the bare two-point function and then identify what is H, what is the matrix H, and then you diagonalize the matrix H and then read off the eigenvalue and then compute, and that gives you the anomalous dimension. So this is a procedure of how to compute the anomalous dimension. Let's see. Now, now I'm gonna do the computation. So I was, use, I was considering a simplest sector. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to use this part of the blackboard. <laughs> so I was thinking about the simplex sector in which uh, operator is made up of just scalars. And if you go to one loop, then essentially what you need to do is to dress this diagram by various like a vertex, interaction vertex. And there are basically three kinds of diagrams. And the first one, so the loop, loop diagrams, is the self-energy. So it's, it basically corrects the propagation, propagator. So for example, you can have a fermion loop or you can have a gauge field in exchange or you can have uh, the contribution coming from scalar quadric interaction. And the important point here is that if you just look at the index structure, then uh, the index structure is the same as this one, by which I mean that if, I, if you have i and j here, then this is still delta ij, where i and j runs from one to six. So it has the same index structure as the uh, two point, sorry, as the uh, free propagator of the scalar. And the second kind of diagram is scalar quotic interaction. And to see what I get from the scalar quotic interaction, 
uh, let me expand out the scalar quotic interaction, uh, which is, uh, so scalar quotic is commutator squared. And this commutator squared is, if you expand it, it's basically given by two times, phi i, phi j, phi i, phi j, minus phi i, phi j, phi j, phi i. So then let's, uh, okay, let's write this scalar quartic interaction in the pictorial notation that I was using. So the first term is ij, ij. So you have ij, ij. So, so well, remember that uh, quartic interaction is uh, actually comes with the trace. So there is some natural ordering of ij, ij. And then the second term uh, is uh, ij, i, sorry, ij, ji. So ij, ji is something like this. So you connect to the same indices and you get something like this. Okay, now I'm going to insert this uh, structure to uh, this diagram. You can insert it here, or you can insert it here, or you can insert it here. Of course, because I'm at, at, I'm at one loop, I can only insert one vertex. But the important point here is that if you want to insert that vertex, then in the end, uh, you get structures which is proportional to uh, something like this. So let me explain why I have this coefficient two. And the reason why I have coefficient two is, for example, if you take this vertex and if you want to try to in, uh, insert it here, then there are like a four different way of insertion, inserting this vertex because uh, I can, well, external guys can be contracted here or here or here or here. And the, both of, like all four possibilities basically give the same index structure. So it actually, it's better to write it like a four and two and two. And on the other hand, if you insert this guy, then depending on like whether the external guy contract, gets contracted like this or like this, you get a different structure. So you get minus two of this guy and minus two of this guy. Is it clear? Okay. And then in addition to this, of course, uh, we have some log divergence with some coefficient. And that's, of course, the same for the self-energy. OK, so there is yet another diagram, which is the gauge in exchange of the gauge boson. Gauge boson. So you have, if you have a two neighboring propagators, then you can basically put the gauge boson propagator. And here, because the gauge boson doesn't carry any SO6 index, uh, the, the final index structure you get is something like this times, again, some factor times log. Of course, if you are curious, then you can just try to do the computation, but it's too boring to do the computation on the blackboard, so I just give you the final result. And the final result, so if you sum them up, sum them up, what you get is this structure of H, uh, where H is, has an overall coupling constant dependence. Okay, we are at one loop, and then Sorry, so let's call it K. So you have, now you have several different index structure. So this is just the same as the propagator, and this is the exchange of indices between two neighboring fields, and, and you also get this structure. And K is essentially K site inside the operator. So, so what I mean by this 
So this is case, sorry, maybe I should write it here. This is case site and this is k plus one site. Of course, this is also k plus case site and this is k plus one site. And what I mean by, he, by k is essentially, so you have a single trace operator, so which carries many indices, but uh, you can insert the interaction vertex uh, between any of neighboring two fields. So I can insert uh, the interaction field at the case field and case plus one field. And you can basically sum over all possibilities. So that's the structure of H. Okay. So it is clear so far? Yeah, I can use the other block boards. Okay. So now I have H written over there. So, so far I was considering like a most general operators made up of just scalars, but let's simplify our lives by focusing on further subsector. So the subsector I'm going to consider is the operator, which is made up of two complex scalars. So let's denote it Y and Z. So subsector. And it's called SU2 subsector, by the way. And if you consider, so, so now I'm going to consider the operator which is made up of just Z and Y, so maybe it can be arbitrarily string on Z and Z and Y. And if you consider this particular choice, then what you first discover is that, yeah, probably people cannot see it anyway, but the first thing you discover is that this structure, index structure, it just gives you zero because uh, there is no way to contract the indices between Z and Z or Z and Y. So because this is essentially the contraction of the indices between neighboring fields. Then what you're left with is just the first two index structure. S and so S simplifies. So the SU2 subsector S simplifies in this way. So now you have two times uh, lambda over 16 pi square, where, and in the integrability literature, we call it g square, which is different from g and mills. I think it's a bit confusing notation, but okay. But unfortunately, this is the most common notation, and times, well, times this minus this. Now, what I'm going to do next is what is, okay, so, so this, if you look at it, this basically is like identity operator because you don't change the indices. And this is the permutation of the indices. So I wrote it, I write it in this way. And what is surprising is that, so especially this is the observation found by Minahan and Zarembo around 2002, but what is surprising is that if you consider this combination, and this happens to be the same as the Hamiltonian of certain spin chain system. So let me first write the Hamiltonian of that system and then explain what is the relation between the two. So the Hamiltonian of the spin chain system that I'm going to write is called XXX spin chain, as I announced earlier. And it's given by this uh, uh, okay, this interaction term. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian of the spin. So if you just forget about one over four here, then it 
well, you immediately see that this is something you learned in statistical mechanics. So these are basically Pauli matrices, so it's just a quantum, the simplest possible quantum spin chain. And, right. Okay, so what is the relation between two? The re relation emerges if you map this operator to a spin chain state by under the map which, which maps z to up spin and y to down spin. So this operator maps to this spin. Then the action of H matrix on the operator is actually isomorphic to the action of this Hamiltonian on this spin chain state. And so far I just described the relation between the two, but what is especially nice about this XXX spin chain is that it's actually integrable and you can solve it by using what's called beta ansatz. And uh, that's the next topic. But so, so the idea, so the, the thing I'm going to do now is to construct the eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. Okay? And the first thing you notice is that uh, there, are, there are actually one, well, actually two simple, simple states, which is, so, so, which is essentially simplest eigenstate is all up spin state because this is essentially ferromagnetic uh, spin chain Hamiltonian and the ground state is given by up spin. Of course, you can also consider the case where you have all down spin, but uh, for my talk, I just, I just need this one. And next, let's ask, what is the next simplest object? And of course, the next simplest object is probably something like the state which has one spin down. So let's uh, label this state by the position of the down spin and let's write it by n. And then let's ask what is the action of this Hamiltonian on this uh, state n. Well, let's see if it's eigenstate or not. Well, of course, it's not eigenstate actually. So to understand the action of this Hamiltonian on a, n, it's actually easier to use this identity minus permutation because you can also apply, think of this identity and permutation as the identity or permutation of the spin. Then you can easily see that if you have just up spin, then identity and permutation just gives you the same answer. So that's why uh, this object is the uh, ground state, which has energy zero. And then if you apply the same thing for this n, then uh, the only non-trivial thing happens when the Hamiltonian acts here or here. And the result, well, I think it's not so hard to see, is two times n, so which comes from identity, identity here, minus n minus one, minus n plus one, which comes from permutation. So after the permutation, this spin, down, the position of the downspin is shifted by one. And you discover that this action is exactly the same as the discrete Laplacian. So it's a discretized version of Laplacian. And then you can immediately say that, okay, so then the eigenstate must be the momentum eigenstate, which is essentially given by this. Right? So you need to sum over n, and p is momentum. And if you are thinking about the infinitely long spin chain, this is actually uh, the exact answer. You don't need to think about anything else. But now we are thinking about the finite size spin chain, so we need to impose the periodicity condition. So, or essentially, if you want to construct the finite size spin chain starting from infinite spin chain, you need to identify the point uh, in this way. N plus L should be the same as N. So, this I, so you need to identify. Under this identification, uh, the, this wave function factor is 
gets mapped to, so E to IPN gets mapped to E to IPN plus L, but in order for the identification to work, you need to set them equal, which basically gives you E to IPL equals one, uh, which is the periodicity condition of the free moving particle. So, so the point here is that although we started with some like a spin chain system, essentially it behaves something like a freely moving particles because the action of the Hamiltonian is essentially discrete Laplacian and the eigenstate is given by uh, the momentum eigenstate. Okay. So now let's do something else. So, okay, so let's do a bit more complicated example which contains two particles or two downspin. Okay, so let's consider a bit more non-trivial example, which is two magnon state. Okay, by the way, uh, magnon is essentially the downspin. So when you view it some particle, uh, people typically use the word magnon. And the two magnon state is spanned by uh, this kind of state where the definition of this kind of state is again the simple generalization of the state over there. Now let's again do the same. Let's ask how the Hamiltonian acts on this state. And then you immediately discovered that because the Hamiltonian is just nearest neighbor, if N1 and N2 are far apart, or more precisely, if n1 minus n2 is larger than 1, then essentially what you get is the sum of discrete Laplacian acting separately for n1 and n2. So if I have, so I can probably write it more expl explicitly. So I have n1 minus 1, n2 minus n1 plus 1, n2, and the same thing for n2, so I have n2 minus 1 minus n1, n2 plus 1. So this means that this Hamiltonian is acting on those downspin, downspins almost separately, which means that it's actually almost free. And in particular, if you consider the case where the particles are far separated, then you discover that, well, so which means that something like plane wave should work. So now we have two momentum, so, so the plane wave should be something like this. But there is actually another possibility of writing the plane wave out of P1, P2, and N1, N2, which is essentially just a permutation of the indices. So, so the answers for the uh, exact wave function for the eigenstate should be something like that. Okay, maybe there might be some coefficient here. Okay, let's draw, write it as S P1, P2 here. So this is just a coefficient. Okay, and actually the coefficient this of uh, the coefficient between this exponential and this exponential is actually precisely determined by considering the case where n1 minus n2 is, sorry, so this should be strictly larger, and where, by considering the case where n1 minus n2 is strictly one. So in that case, because two magnons are neighboring each other, so these, that two discrete Laplacian doesn't act separately, so, 
So the Hamiltonian gives you something complicated, well, a little bit more complicated. And let's see. Yeah, oh, t -t 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 -t. yeah, well, I can probably do that. I have time for that. So, so now the only case we missed by this consideration is this one. And, well, if you just act it, then get something like this. Okay. So now, uh, the question is, can we use this behavior to determine this value? So let's write, sorry, so this didn't make sense actually. So I should multiply this by n1 times n2 and sum it over. So let's write this wave function as psi n1 n2. And what I'm going to impose is this condition. So I act the state with h and then project it to this guy. But this should be equal to the energy times n, n plus 1 times psi because it's eigenstate. And by the idea is to, by imposing that, you we determine this condition, this equation. So let's, let's write the right-hand side explicitly and by applying this, and you get something like this. Psi n minus one, n plus one, minus psi n, n plus two, plus psi two times psi n, n plus one, equals energy times psi n, n plus one. Okay, so this is the equation you need to solve. But in order to solve this equation, you also need to know the value of E. Uh, but the value of B is determined by considering the case where n1 and n2 are far separate. When n1 and n2 are far separate, as I said, they almost act like a freely non-interacting wave, a plane wave. So the energy of this state should be the sum of the plane wave state. And the energy of the plane wave state is the one I determine over there. Okay, I actually didn't write it down explicitly, but the energy of the single particle state turned out to be, well, if you use that Lagrange, sorry, if you use that expression, then it turns out to be 4G times one minus cosine P. Well, it's just that, okay. So, so now you have everything and you just need to solve it. And after, if you solve it by, for example, using Mathematica, then you discover that this coefficient, relative coefficient, must be this one, one minus one plus e to ip2, minus one plus e to, sorry, minus two plus e to ip1, uh, one plus e to ip1, minus two plus e to ip2, uh, okay, so this doesn't look super nice, but there is a way, nice way of uh, rewriting this expression by introducing a new variable, which is also, which is called rapidity variable. So this is a kind of uh, analog of Sita I introduced yet yesterday. And if you write it in terms of rapidity, then this object has a very simple form, which is u, one minus u2 minus i over u1 minus u2 plus i. Okay. So, so this is what you found, uh, what you can get from the, uh, from solving the eigenstate condition. And then there is another condition you need to uh, worry about in the end because uh, as, I, as, as was the case for the one particle case, 
Uh, this eigenstate is completely fine if you consider infinitely long spin chain, but then you need to impose the periodicity condition. And the periodicity condition here is, okay, let's write it here. So periodicity condition here is now given by psi n1, n2 equals psi n2, n1 plus L. So, so I if you impose this condition to this wave function, then uh, essentially you get two equation. Another equation is this one. By the way, this is P2, P1 is actually the inverse of P1, P2. That's most obvious in the rapidity variable, I, I, I think, because if you swap U1 minus U1 and U2, you get the inverse. Okay, so, and these two equations, which comes from the periodistic condition, is called the beta ansatz. So this is a generalization of a simple periodistic condition for the one magnon case. So the physical interpretation is that if you want to move a particle around the spin chain, then you get the usual phase shift, which comes from the freely moving particle. And in addition to that, you have additional phase from the interaction between the particles. But the wave function should be periodic under this movement. So that's why you impose this, this combination to be one. And you need to impose the combination for each particle. And now, you can repeat this exercise for multi-particle cases, but, but essentially, the argument is the same. And the reason is, for the multi-particle case, the state is spanned by, or labeled by, set of m integers, where, which is, okay, so this essentially specifies the position of the downspin. And, but you can start from the case where all the particles are far apart, and then uh, you, you start, and then that gives, okay, so if you consider that case, then you can immediately say that the result should be sum over the, uh, sum over the plane waves, and then you have to worry about relative phase or relative, relative normalization between different plane waves. But in order to understand that, you just need to consider the case where like a two of them are next to each other and then apply the Hamiltonian. And basically that gives you essentially the same equation. And essentially, by doing so, you get the structure something like this. So this is the structure of the wave function. times n1 and m, and this psi of n1 and ma and nm is sigma of so. So you need to sum over all possible wave functions, sorry, all possible plane waves, which is basically given by all, uh, the summation of uh, the all possible permutations. And so you multiply the plane wave, e to i, P sigma k and k. And then I multiply some factor s of sigma. So the, so what is this s of sigma? And s of sigma is defined for each permutation. So let's consider the permutation of the three uh, particle. Then, okay, and then consider k, the case where uh, you have you, your permutation maps one to three to three to one. Then the idea is to draw the lines between the same numbers and then read off the intersection. So in this case, there is an intersection between one and three and two and three. So in that case, S of sigma 
is S of P1, P3, times S of P2, P3, where S is the S which appeared in the two-particle uh, S matrix. Sorry, it's the two-particle wave function. So this, essentially, this kind of simple, well, product structure is coming from the fact that uh, the Heisenberg spin chain is nearest neighbor, only has nearest neighbor interaction, but it also is suggesting something like factorization to two particle is happening here. And indeed, for this XXX spin chain, you can actually construct explicitly infinitely many charges, and then you can also do the scattering experiment uh, by considering infinitely long spin chain and, and send the magnons. And then you indeed discover that the S matrix is indeed given by a product of S matrix, 2 to 2 S matrix, and the 2 to 2 S matrix is precisely the one I wrote over there. So, and this basically allows you, okay, to determine the energy spectrum. And so the way you determine the energy spectrum is as follows. So after writing this wave function, you further need to impose the periodicity condition. And in this case, periodicity condition uh, takes this form, J not equal K, S P K, P J equals one. So this is a natural generalization of the periodicity condition for the two particle case. And I need to impose, for, impose it for every K. So what you, are need, what you need to do is to solve this equation. And once you solve this equation, then the energy of the state is just given by the sum of E of PK, where E of PK is something like 4G squared times one minus cosine T, which I wrote somewhere over there. So what this is telling us is that for each solution of this equation, which is called the beta and this equation, uh, there is actually ex uh, some uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian, the eigenvalue is computed by this simple expression. So this is how we can use integrability not just to construct, constrain this matrix, but to constrain the energy of the uh, periodic system. So, and of course, because, as I said, this spin chain problem is mapped to the uh, problem of uh, computing the anomalous dimension of the n equals 4 super mu theory, uh, this solution basically gives you the spectrum of n equals 4 super mu theory. But so far, what I talked about was just about one loop. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about how to generalize uh, this kind of construction to finite coupling in lambda. But of course, doing finite coupling is really hard. So we need to use some intuition. And then uh, there is some connection with the, boost, the idea of bootstrap. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very clear talk. Are there urgent questions before the break? If not, then we have the questions, as always, in the discussion, sh a discussion session at 5. So we have a, a short break of 20 minutes outside and see you back at five o'clock. And thank you very much again.